Hello again, physics friends. Today we're going to have a fairly brief video to talk about the um, quantum experiment called the quantum eraser. And the basic idea here is um, that we want to show that although you can get rid of an interference pattern by making an observation, it doesn't fundamentally destroy that underlying interference pattern, that you can somehow re-scramble the information later um, to recover the quantum interference pattern. Um, so the word eraser here is that we're erasing definite information about the system to recover the quantum interference. And as, as motivation for why we want to do this, if we think back to the two-slit experiment, um, we said that you will get on the distant wall, you will see a two-slit interference pattern as long as you do not have which way path information about um, which path the quantons took through the two slits. So for example, we said like, if we were going to monitor one slit, not block the slit, but just monitor it and visualize or be able to detect what slit a quanton took, then that would eliminate this interference pattern and you just get the two piles of sand distribution of quantons. Um, and in doing so, you might think that the act of monitoring the slit somehow fundamentally alters the states of the quantons in a way that destroys this interference pattern. But what's quite remarkable is that you can show that if you're able to somehow later re-scramble the which-way path information um, in terms of which quantons took which path, um, then you can actually recover this underlying interference pattern once again. Now, doing so with a two-slit experiment turns out to be a little bit tricky. And so instead of working with a, or to describe, it turns out to be tricky to describe. And it's much more straightforward um, to, to restrict our conversation to a two-state system. And for that, we're going to use the Mach Zenter interferometer, as we've been using before. So we're going to focus on the Mach Zenter interferometer. And if you remember... Um, there we have an input, Oops. an input, and we have a beam splitter that creates two paths through our system. And the key with the interferometer is that we have another beam splitter here that recombines the paths. So we have beam splitter one, we have beam splitter two, we have our input beam here, and we have these two mirrors. And as currently configured, um, if you're monitoring at the exit here and you detect a quanton, you have no way of knowing if the quanton took one path or the other, and therefore you do not have which way path information, and therefore you should expect to see an interference pattern. Okay. So that's just a refresher on what the Mach Zender is. Um, so we're going to build up toward the quantum eraser, um, starting with a basic Mach Zender interferometer. Okay, so here we have our basic setup, where we have, it's the same as what I drew before, um, but I've added one feature that I want to describe. So here we have our input atoms that are sp um, that encounter beam splitter one that sets up two paths. And if we do not monitor or have which way path information, then the quanton is in a superposition of taking both paths and can arrive at detector D um, in that superposition state. Okay. Um, in the past, we've talked about altering the length through the interferometer by moving a mirror back and forth a little bit. Here we're going to do the same thing um, in terms of changing the length of one arm relative to the other, but we're not going to do, achieve that by moving a mirror. Instead, we have what's called a phase shifter that's going to shift the phase of the wave of the quanton on one arm relative to the other. And by adjusting the amount of phase shift, we will get an interference pattern in detector D. And as we've seen before, that will look something like this, right? So as we adjust the phase, the number of counts that we'll see in detector D um, will undergo an oscillation pattern where we'll um, 
and for some phase shifts have zero counts in the detector and for some phase shifts have a maximum number of counts in the detector. Um, and the number of counts in the detector as a function of phase is this periodic function which indicates interference in the um, interferometer. Okay, so this is a system that exhibits interference because we have no which way path So we get interference in the count weight versus phase in detector D. So now let's add a few features to the Mach Zender interferometer. So here's our revised version. Um, we once again have an input to pass through the system and a detector at the output but we've added these two um, boxes with an X in them. And those boxes represent what are called nonlinear crystals. So let's explain what that means real quick. A nonlinear crystal in the context of this experiment means we send in one photon of, a, um, of one color and it gets converted into two um, separate photons of different colors than the input. And in particular, we'll send in one high energy photon and we get in two lower energy photons out, such that the energy of the output photons add up to equal the energy of the incoming photons. So here we're trading the energy of a photon for number of photons, and the exiting photons um, are correlated in, in a way, okay? So we have two of those devices here. We'll call them X1 and X2 for these nonlinear crystals. And now let's look what happens. Um, when a quanton enters the system, or photon in this case, enters the system, um, we can detect it at D, um, or at least we can detect a photon count at D, because let's say a blue photon enters here, and let's say it reflects, X2 is going to fire, and it's going to send out a green and a blue, a green and a red photon. Um, if the green photon is detected by D2, the red photon is going to make its way to this detector. Now let's look at what happens then. Because um, either D1 or D2 is going to fire, right? because the photon is either going to interact with this crystal or that crystal, we're going to get a count or a click at either D1 or D2. Let's say D2 fires and clicks. Well, if D2 clicks, then we know which way path information because we know the quanton must have taken this path that includes crystal 2. If, however, D1 fires, we know the quanton takes path, uh, the path that contains crystal 1. And so a count at our ma uh, the main detector, big D, will be accompanied by a click or a tick at detectors D1 or D2. And based on which of these two small d detectors clicked, we'll be able to determine which path it was taken. And as a result, we will not have which way path information. Oh, sorry, we will have which way path information. So we will not have an interference pattern. So here again, we have which way path information, so we lose the interference pattern. And this phenomenon of um, trading which way path information for interference is um, often referred to as complementarity. Okay, in this case, we have uh, two features, knowledge of which path the quanton took and the possibility of measuring an interference pattern. Those are complementary with each other. Um, if you have one, you cannot have the other. And in no version of this experiment in the Mach Center interferometer will you be able to both know which path the quanton took and observe the interference pattern. If you have which way path information, you lose the interference pattern. If you um, lose which way path information, you have an interference pattern. Okay. So, so far we've seen the first scenario, we do not have which way path information and we get an interference pattern. In the revised version, these nonlinear crystals and the small detectors here provide us which way path information, and therefore the interference pattern is lost. Okay? Now, the key idea here is um, 
although we have which way path information in this experiment, we should be able to re-scramble that information so that which way path information is actually lost and that should recover the interference pattern. And let's see how that shakes out. Okay, so here we have, once again, our revised experiment that we just discussed in the previous slide. And I've just copied it here and I haven't changed it at all yet. But we're gonna build up, um, by modifying this graph, we're gonna, or this plot, we're gonna build up the quantum eraser experiment. And we have to do two things. The first is, by complementarity, we know that if we want to see an interference pattern, we have to scramble or get rid of which way path information. And right now, these detectors D1 and D2 are providing us with which way path information because if D1 fires, we know that that photon came from X1, and therefore we know the quanton took this upper path. So how can we scramble that? Well, what we can do is insert a new beam splitter or a third beam splitter in this experiment. We'll call it beam splitter three because it's the third one here. And notice what that does now. Let's say D2 fires. Well, that photon could have come from crystal two and that photon would have gone through beam splitter three, transmitted through, but D2 could also fire if crystal one had emitted the photon and that photon reflected off of beam splitter three. So the, the fact that D2 fires um, does not reveal which path was taken because a quanton could have interacted with either of these two crystals for D2 to fire. So beam splitter three serves the purpose of scrambling which way path information, or if you like the, the word eraser here, is that beam splitter three is erasing the which way path information that we used to have in this previous experiment. That's the eraser. And by erasing that which way path information, we should be able to recover the interference pattern, okay? But perhaps surprisingly, if you look at the counts in detector D as you vary the phase in the arm of the detector, you do not, you do not get an interference pattern. So that's rather surprising. But interference can be recovered by doing the following. If we bring in a coincidence counter that only counts events um, when both detector two fires, so I'm connecting in this red line uh, an electrical cable from my detector big capital D to my coincidence counter, and I'm gonna do the same for D2. If I connect D2 and big D in coincidence, okay, and I only count events when both D2 and D are firing, then that, um, that data set does show interference. In other words, if I look at the D2 and D coincidence counts as a function of the phase shift value, I do get um, a rate that depends on phase in a periodic way as predicted um, by quantum mechanics. So somehow we need to uh, measure the coincidence rates in detector D, not just the raw count rate in detector D. So the, the interference pattern relies on the entanglement of the photon that arrives at capital D with a photon that arrives at the, the lowercase d detectors. Right? Uh, notice that, for example, beams, uh, the photon entering crystal two is destroyed and in its place, two photons emerge. And those two photons are correlated with each other. They're entangled with each other, I should say. Um, and so the interference arises by the detection of, of those photons in coincidence. So I hope you've enjoyed this explanation of the quantum eraser experiment. This is just one example of um, quantum eraser style experiments. There, um, the basic idea though is you have a system where you get um, which way path information that you can somehow later destroy to recover an interference pattern. And here it's shown with photons in a Mach Zender, Mach Zender interferometer, but it can be um, implemented in other systems as well. Well, that's it for now. Uh, until next time, take care and be well.